I wanted to start before I introduce my subject by telling you an early early teen experience. I think I was an early teens experience I had. I grew up in a church, a traditional uh, church that emphasized the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord, but said very little about the Holy Spirit. Uh, as I started out in, uh, I wasn't in ministry at the time, I was in the ministry of music. I began to visit other places where the emphasis was on the Holy Spirit and a thirst began to build up in my heart uh, to be sure that I had a real relationship with the Holy Spirit. Uh, so I'm a very young man. I walked around uh, Mountain Road to our church and scheduled an appointment with our pastor and asked the pastor, uh, did I have the Holy Spirit? Had I really experienced the, the Holy Spirit? How, how, how real was that? And he said to me, uh, he said, yes, Brother Jakes, he said, you have the Holy Spirit. And I said, well, Reverend Gilmer, I said, when, when did I get it? And he said, you got it when you joined the church. And I, uh, I said, okay, I was polite. I thanked him and I started walking back around the road and I remember this like it was yesterday. And I was walking around the road and I thought that can't be right. And this is what I thought. And I don't know why I thought this thought. I, I knew very little about scripture, but this is what I thought. I know when a cool breeze blows across the back of my neck and he's telling me that I was filled with the spirit and I missed it. And I was so sad, I was almost in tears because I thought something's wrong with that. I don't have it. I don't know why I use the analogy of a cool breeze, but it's a perfect setup for our conversation tonight because I'm here to talk to you about uh, gleanings on pneumatology. Now I'm gonna ask Cammy to put up my my initial screen. Cammy, are you with me? There we go. Yeah. So we're gonna look at the whole gleanings of the Holy Spirit and what that means and what it represents. And we're going to take a really deep look at, at the whole understanding uh, of pneumatology. We're going to begin to look at it from all of its various aspects and variations. And, and the funny thing about it was I said, I know when a cool breeze blows across the back of my neck. And at its core, that's what pneumatology is all about. It comes from a Latin word where we get spiritus. But in the etymology of the word, it also means to breathe or to blow. It has a basic meaning of air in motion. Breath is something necessary to life. And in the Greek tragedy, it is used uh, of the breath of life. It is the spirit of the new, it is translated spirit in the New Testament. In Hebrew, it's ruach, word meaning the breath of the spirit. So when we start thinking of the spirit at that point in my life, walking back home around Mountain Road, teary-eyed almost because I was in search of the Holy Spirit. In reality, the Spirit of God was in search of me. And that push-pull between me being in search for him and him being in search for me uh, begins to epitomize my, my struggle to learn and to know more and to have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. As Job said, the Spirit of God uh, has made me and the breath of the Almighty have given me life. That, that whole experience of seeking God and God seeking me and seeking God and God seeking me started the exhaling and the inhaling of a relationship that continues to grow and to develop uh, in my search and my understanding uh, about God. When you get, you can pull it down, Kimmy. When you get into the whole understanding, we're going to start in the book of Genesis in chapter one, and uh, there's no other place to start. Uh, the book of Genesis is, of course, themed the book of beginnings. And the very first phrase of the book, uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, in the Hebrew, Breshit Bara, Breshit Bara, in the beginning, God created. It's the common 
translation. Everything starts with God. God does not explain himself. He does not reveal himself. He just appears in the beginning, God not God's beginning, in the beginning God's predating time. God is eternal, man is temporal, in the beginning God. So Breshit Bara created the heavens and the earth, the word Bara to be made without the aid of pre-existing substance. So the first reference to God uh, causes us to understand that he is without explanation. I believe that God cannot be explained, he must be revealed. If we could explain him, then we could define him. Then we could be greater than him. But God just is. He that cometh to God must first believe um, that he is. It's interesting in my study for the class, I, I stumbled up on something that I thought was really, uh, really interesting. First of all, the first uh, 11 chapters of the book uh, of Genesis deals with the primeval history uh, of mankind. And I won't get I won't get out of the first or second chapters, but the primeval history as opposed to around the 12th chapter gets into the ancestral history and really starts to delineate and describe Abraham and God's plan for man and where God ultimately wants to take us. As you know, uh, the book of Genesis is described to be, uh, the, is believed to be uh, written by Moses. I would suggest to you more than likely when Moses begins to seek God and says, I, you know me, but I don't know you. And the Bible said he caused his glory to pass by him. And in the King James Version, it said he showed him his back parts, back parts being history. And Moses records for us uh, the book of beginnings. It was interesting, though, when I started looking at it and I started researching it uh, just a little bit, uh, just to understand uh, the whole notion that we we are introduced to God and in the next breath we are introduced to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit steps on the stage. There is an inference that is used uh, in the understanding of the book of Genesis called the law of first mention, that however we first see him, there is a continuity throughout the scriptures where, where the blood is introduced. There's a continuity throughout the scriptures where salvation is introduced There's a continuity throughout uh, the scriptures. It is the law of uh, first mention. So the first mention of God, of the Holy Spirit is very important tonight because when we look at the first mention of the Holy Spirit, we begin to understand that it describes God as creating and uh, uh, some recent translations say it shouldn't be in the beginning. It should be at the at the council of thought. And I thought that was interesting because uh, it kind of correlated with me with John 1.1 1, 1 in the beginning was the word logos, it, the thoughts of God, the word was with God, the word was God. I'm not a Hebrew scholar. I won't try to pass myself off to be, but it's just interesting to consider. What I am going to talk to you about tonight is what the Bible says to us about the Holy Spirit and what we ought to think about the Holy Spirit. And when we start talking about the Spirit of God and we know that he is a rock, the very breath of God, the very wind of God and all throughout the scriptures, we are limited in our understanding of the Holy Spirit because we don't have any way to clearly define uh, the Holy Spirit. We are left to use terms like in the New Testament, he was like as a body burning with fire. He was like as a body rushing wind. He was like as are all metaphors or similes to describe the undescribable. Uh, when we think of it, it's actually anthropomorphic terms. I won't deviate from anthropomorphic terms. So anthropomorphic terms are those terms that are used to describe the undescribable, where we use human attributes to describe God. For example, the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the earth looking for someone he can show himself strong to. Doesn't mean that God has eyeballs rolling all over the earth, but it is using something that you do understand to explain something that you don't understand. He covereth me with his feathers. Doesn't mean that he's a bird, but it's just trying to give you a sense or a feeling or a suggestion of something divine using something temporal as a comparative analysis to begin to realize that which is divine. 
So our ability to really teach on the Holy Spirit is somewhat limited because there are no comparables. There are comparisons, but there are no comparables. His ability to move and to do things defy English descriptions or language's ability to articulate what he's able to do. So we will see in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And we're going to, I'm going to talk about it in several categories. First, I'm going to talk about the posture of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and I laugh when I say that uh, because the word posture itself actually conflicts with the whole idea of the Holy Spirit. Because when you start talking about the posture of the Holy Spirit, I'm waiting for it to get, there we go. When you start talking about the posture of the Holy Spirit, uh, I couldn't really find anything because when you start talking about anthropomorphism, you have to realize that you are, you are just making comparisons. He moved upon the face of the waters, uh, could be translated, he brooded like a hen does over her chicks, but they are all uh, anthropomorphic. The posture of the Holy Spirit is anthropomorphic because do spirits have form to sit? And yet I'm going to talk about God sitting on the earth because I am limited by language to describe the undescribable, to say that God introduces himself as a hoverer, as a brooding spirit, as a spirit that broods over the earth so that he might birth or deliver or bring forth. Thank you, Kemi. And, and when you begin to, to look at it and to understand that, that, that first introduction, that first mention of the Holy Spirit shows us the Holy Spirit being intimately involved. And, the, and in this one inference, we have spirit hovering over water. And out of that, the creation begins to manifest and begins to become more relevant. And that whole hovering of the Holy Spirit stays with us throughout the whole Bible. Every time you see the Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord came upon her. When it talks about the Virgin Mary, the Spirit of the Lord came upon them. When it talks about the prophets, the Spirit of the Lord came upon them. When it talks about the Holy Spirit and he sat upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, he sat on them. But, but, how, but a spirit doesn't really sit, but it's just a, our way of explaining the unexplainable. What we want you to see is a couple of things that are important. One, that he is intimately involved in the creative process. Secondly, that he abides over that which is formed, that he introduces himself as hovering, as brooding, uh, as, as dwelling over top of the earth to bring forth almost like hatching an egg. And that whole posture of the Holy Spirit is important for us to understand, to recognize that it is through the Holy Spirit that God becomes intimately entangled in our affairs and connected with us. And I wanna talk about it. I'm gonna talk about it from three different aspects. Uh, the, the sitting of the Holy Spirit or the posture of the Holy Spirit, the speaking of the Holy Spirit or the proclamation of the Holy Spirit. And then I'm going to talk about the strategy of the Holy Spirit uh, just as we go further along. If I get as far as I'm trying to go tonight, uh, you all pray for me. I think I might be able to get there. I tried to find an illustration. You'll notice with the illustration she put up, it had a dove because again, the dove is a comparison. It's a description. He descended like as a dove. It didn't say he was a dove. It's just trying to give you visuals of something that we have nothing to compare it to. That's how sacred our understanding of the Holy Spirit has to be for us to really to, to begin to understand what God had in mind for us. We're gonna see about seven times in the book of Genesis the breath of life. He breathed into him the breath of life, the breath of life, Zoe, and he became a living nephesh. She became a living soul. So the breath of the Almighty hath given me life implies that until God breathed on Adam, he was a lifeless form. Until God hovered over the earth, it was a lifeless place. So in both the hovering over the earth and God hovering over man, 
he he gives life the breath of the almighty has given me life everything else begins to be born out of this initial experience of the breath of the almighty god when you think about uh the the creation of a man which i'm going to get to more prominently in a minute everything else god spoke to and it became what let there be let there be let there be but when it came to man he became intimately involved formed him touching him and then breathing in him the the, the image i see is almost like mouth to mouth resuscitation he breathes into him the breath of lives and he becomes a living soul the hovering of the spirit in the creation of the earth leads us eventually into the hovering of god in the creation of man and like like the water that god first hovered over man is 70% water and so out of the earth we see the water and the spirit we see it again in the creation you see the continuity between the two things and it's important that we understand that we're seeing god hovering over water when god hovers over man he's hovering over water and earth in the same way he hovers over the creation but what i want to deal with when we start talking about this hovering is the intimacy that we see here the connect the connectivity between the terrestrial and the celestial between the human and the divine when we first are introduced to the holy spirit we see god hovering over a mess throughout the scriptures we will see god hovering over a mess all the way to the book of acts we will see god hovering over a mess all the way to contemporary society we see god hovering over a mess so when we start thinking about the holy spirit we think about god being intimately involved in development in creation in establishing in in doing in involvement and once we understand that god wants us to understand that he takes the posture of hovering on us that he sits on us that he brings order out of chaos that he separates this from that and this goes here and that goes there that the order comes out of the chaos because of the hovering of the holy spirit 